Okay, so here we are. So we're starting week six, so we're going to start talking about arrays. I want to cover some of the functions because we only had one class period last week. I want to, I want to go through some more information on functions. Um, and then I want to address any questions you have with your homework assignment and do a couple of function examples. Um, so we're going to do that for maybe the first um, 40 minutes or so today. And then we're going to jump into the, to the work on arrays. Okay? Notice that your assignment for week seven is out there. Okay, so we'll have class next week, and we're going to talk about input validation, and we're going to be doing a bunch of loops and modules with a lot of input validation. Your assignment this week is with arrays. Your assignment next week is really around the rock, paper, scissors game, which is, in, which is primarily about input validation. Okay, and so that um, begins to get um, um, into some... Uh, the input validation can start adding lines of code, so that starts getting a little compli complicated. Okay, so but we will um, we'll cover that in examples. Your week seven assignment um, is due the, the Sunday at the end of spring break, so you have two full weeks to work on that. I hope that you do it at the end of next week and you don't spend your last day of your of your spring break break working on your homework. But it's your time; you do what you want. Okay. So next week for or, or this week for six for week six for arrays we have two assignments. Okay, so instead of one um, instead of one assignment with two problems inside of it, we actually have two assignments with one problem each. Okay, still two problem sets, uh, but it's separated into six A and six B, um, which uh, is really just makes it easier for me. So, and I, you know we all know that that's what's important is to make it easy on me, right? So. Um, that's not true. I care about my students. So um, anyway, so, so we have 6A and 6B. That was a joke, by the way, in case you're so, you know, I, I do care about you guys. This is, this should be easier from a, uh, from a canvas standpoint in keeping up with it, okay, to have those two assignments. All right, so um, let's, let's dive into the functions material again. Um, and since I'm recording this lecture, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to stick back here, um, and uh, um, so that I can so that my voice will sh will show up on the video properly. Okay, so um, quick review on functions. What did we? What's the difference between a function and a module? A function returns a value, right? They're basically the same. Otherwise, a function is just a type of module that has a return type. Okay, so instead of outputting something or doing a display. Its, its output step is going to be a return value. Okay, so so we have a module. The input section for a module is typically parameters, right? We send data and as parameters to 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 a module, and so the input section of, of that module is going to be those parameters. The processing section of the module is going to be whatever logic we have in there, some math or some manipulation of the data, and then the output section is typically a return statement. Okay. The input section sometimes in a module is sometimes it's parameters. Sometimes we actually do will actually prompt the user or read data from somewhere. Okay, it doesn't have to be parameters, but those are the two choices. I can either collect data from the user directly using using a, an input or input from a file, or I can accept the data as parameter. Okay, the processing section is the same as any piece of code we have, just math or logic, and then my output section in a in a in a module is without a return statement, is typically some kind of display. In a function, I'm going to do a return. Okay, so here's a here's an example on the screen of the of the function definition. This is a C sharp function definition. Okay, and I've made a mistake here because in C sharp, the name of the method needs to be uppercase. Okay, so here we have in this is C sharp. This is C-sharp function definition. We're using public static. Um, check it out. I have a little pointer. So we have public here, public and static. So these are these are the, the scoping of, of, of the function. So every, every program in C-sharp is made up of classes. So we're working in a single class called main class in REPL. Okay? As your programs get more and more complex, you'll add other classes. You'll have 10, 15, 20, 100 different classes in your, in your program. Each class is doing something different. Some of them are logic classes. Some of them are data classes. Um, some of them are combination logic and data. And so, um, so in, in, in which case, these public and static 
are defining the methods inside your class. So because we're using a single class, and we're not using any kind of, of object orientation, uh, object-oriented approach, we're just finding everything as public and static. Okay, So that will become more clear as you get into upper levels, and you'll, you'll be using uh, other things besides private. You can, some of them are going to be internal or, or private, public, read-only, some of those other values. Um, and then the static will go away. You won't always have a static value. But for now, we're defining all of our methods and all of our modules and all of our functions using public static. Okay. The third step is the return data type. So in the modules that we've defined, there was no return data type, so it was void. That means there's no return. Okay? That means that the output section of the, of the module is going to be some kind of display. There's no or something other than returning value. So that just means there is no return type if you say void as the data type of the module. In this example, we're using int, okay? which means that the return type is an integer. Okay? Then you have the name of the, of the function or the module. In this case, get parameter is the name, and then we have the, the parameter list. So really, the only difference between a function and a module, as we've learned them so far, is this return type. We say from void, and we change it to imp, and to int rather, and then we add a return statement somewhere in the, in the code. Okay? So in this case, get perimeter. This looks like the perimeter of a rectangle or a square, right? So int, int of width and height. And we return width times height. Okay. So the, the the execution of the function stops when the return statement runs. So I can have more than one return statement in a function, and as soon as I hit one of those return statements, the function is over. Okay. So that means I can, if I'm inside a while loop, and I'm saying you know maybe I'm in a while loop and I'm doing input validation, I want you to and I prompt you, please enter a number between one and ten. And I'm testing each number you enter to make sure it's between 1 and 10. And my while loop's just going to go on forever until I hit a return statement. As soon as you enter a number between 1 and 10, I'm going to do if the number you entered is between 1 and 10, then return the number. Okay? So at that point, as soon as I hit that return statement, my, my function is over. Which means I, I break out of any if statement I'm in, I break out of any while loop I'm in. So I, as soon as I hit that return statement, the function is over. Okay? And that is, I can't stress that enough, that's usually a good thing. Occasionally, you'll make a mistake and you'll put code after your return statement that will not run. All right? Okay. You can overload functions. This is a, um, I won't dwell on this very much, but you can define um, function names with the same name with different parameter types. Okay? So in this case, I have two functions. They're both named perimeter. Okay? But this one has two integer parameters, and this one has four integer parameters. Okay, so in this case, even though they have the same name, they're two separate functions. Okay, this is called overloading, and what makes them unique is the signature. So this line right here, public static in primer, this is what we call the signature. This must be unique. Okay, I can't define another another method named perimeter which has an int of height and uh, or or you know volume and and weight or something. Right? Just because the parameter names are different doesn't mean that my that doesn't make it unique. What makes it unique is the is the name and the data types and order of the parameters. Okay? So once I define a perimeter with two integer values, that's it. I can't define another method named perimeter with two integer values. I can define one with three integer parameters or a double and a and an integer parameter. But once I define something with two integer parameters, that's it. I can't overload that any further. Okay? But see, in this example, I've defined the second method with four integer parameters. Okay? And so this is so these are this is called overloading. Okay. Alright, so we have a whole bunch of built-in functions. So you can write your own, which we'll do some examples of that. As well, but you also get a whole bunch of built-in functions that come with C Sharp. So, what are some examples of built-in functions that we've already used? Convert, right? Convert dot two and thirty-two, and it takes a it takes one argument of a string value, and it returns what? What kind of data does it return? An integer, right? So the convert 
The convert is a is a convert dot two and thirty two. That's a function. It takes a string parameter, returns an integer. Okay. What's another one? Console dot read line. Okay. How many how many arguments does that take? Console dot read line. None. We haven't we haven't been sending it any. And what kind of what is the return type of that? What's the return type of console dot read line? When we type something in on the on the console, what what data type do we get back? It's a string, right? So then, so we've been using those together. So we take console dot read line, which returns a string, and we use that as an argument in convert dot two and thirty two, right? And then some magic happens. Okay. Okay. So we have these built-in functions: math dot square root. Math.pow. Math.pow is the is the exponent. Okay. Um, of the uh, is the is the exponent function. That's four to the power of two, is what we see here. This math.pow four to the power of two. Okay. Math.square root returns the square root of whatever number you put in. Okay. These are built-in functions. Okay. And so you can see here we're actually taking that that function, that built-in function. We're running it, and then we're assigning the value to this variable called result. Okay. Same thing here. We're assigning the value here to this variable called area, which doesn't really make sense in this in this example. But but this is the value of this four raised to the power of two is assigned to this variable named area. Okay. We have other mathematical functions. Absolute value. Math dot round. Math dot ceiling. Math dot floor. These are all built in. Um, these are all built in functions. Returns math.floor. This actually does not return the sign of an argument. This um, truncates decimal precision of the argument. It's kind of like round down. I don't know if it has. Well, have, we'd have to look at the at the the description to see exactly what the parameters are for that. But math.round rounds to a nearest integer, math.ceiling rounds up, math.floor is typically a round down, but can also act as a truncation. Truncate just means to cut off. So where I, math.floor, if I'd say, give me the, the round down to the nearest integer is the same as just truncating the decimal precision off. You just get rid of it. Okay. So we can have, we can look at the, um, at the, the, the Microsoft um, documentation online. Okay. These are this website. Can you guys see that on the on the screen? Is that better? So this um on the projector. So this um we can see this these examples. This goes through all of the the math dot or all of the math libraries. So you can scroll through here. You have a bunch of examples of absolute values. You can read through this code and you can you can get some some idea of what's of how to use each of these each of these methods. Okay. So there's going to be a list of what the methods are that, are that are engaged here. So here's all the absolute value methods. They over, over, overloaded to take a whole bunch of different. Um, the light just came back on. Why does it do that? Okay, overloaded to 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 take a bunch of different data types. So I can do math math absolute on a decimal value, a double value, an integer, etc. So there's a lot of built-in, a lot of built-in functions here, and you can click on each one. So if we look at math.floor for a double here, we can click on that and we can get a detailed description of what it does. Look, and here's a bunch of examples. So if I take ceiling of 7.03, I'm going to get an 8. If I take the floor, I'm going to get a 7. Okay, And we can see in this case, it doesn't take any parameters. It's really just a truncation. So okay, it also has some remarks here. So this, this Microsoft documentation is really very good, and all of the pages are going to have the same format, okay? And that they're all going to to have some kind of example. They're going to tell you. They're going to define the the method, tell you what it does. They're going to have examples um, of those of how to of how to use those. If the if if it's a description of a class, it's going to show you what all the methods and function and, and properties of that class are, are that are built into the language are going to be. If it's a description of a function by itself. Which is what we're looking at here. It's going to show you just how to use that function. Okay, so 
try to try to explore these a little bit and learn to use them. They're very useful, okay? And uh, and you get a lot of information here, and you learn a lot about C sharp uh, from doing this. There's a link. There is some site like this for every language out there: Java, Python, Ruby, whatever's out there. There is some doc site um, that is going to be the the definitive guide to um, to the language, and and so learn how to read them uh, because they are extremely useful. Okay, so here we go. Um, here's um, here's some more. Here's convert. So we can convert to an integer, to a decimal, to a double. It looks like it takes a string data type. Oops, it takes a string data type and returns um, and returns whatever you're converting to. So in this case, it takes a string data type and converts to an integer. String data type converts to a double. Okay, so we've used those. Here's console.readline. Here's an interesting one. Try parse. This, this is going to come into play when we get into input validation. This one, what happens if we, when we're using convert.2 and 32 in our, in our programs, and we type in something that's not an integer? What's been happening? We've been getting a runtime error, right? Some, the program just bombs, and we just have to start all over again, right? So try parse is a, is, is a companion to, to the convert logic. So in this case, if I do a try parse, I will get a conversion of the of the string value into into an integer if it works. So if, if it's not convertible, then it won't throw an error. Okay, so in this case I'll get a Boolean expression. So if I say in 32try parse, here's the value I want to I want to, to convert, and here's where I want it, here's the value I want to convert it into. And then if it's convertible, then valid is going to equal to true. So I can do input validation on this. So I can protect myself from a runtime error. If I ask the user to type an integer and they type a, a, a letter, then my program won't bomb. We'll be, dive, we'll be jumping into that next week and when we talk about input validation. Okay, a bunch of built-in functions on the string objects. I can see, I can get the length of a string. I can convert it to upper or lower case. I can take a substring so I can get the middle portion of a string or the beginning characters of a string or something like that. So here if I wanted to say, you know, enter a, enter a name, enter a password, for example, but it's got to be at least 10 characters long. I can, I can collect that information from the user and then I can use the length function to make sure that it's, that it's reaching the minimum length. Okay? What do you think two upper and two lower do? Just converts to upper and lower, right? Now, those functions, two upper and two lower, are what, are what is known as, as, um, as accessor functions, okay? And that they, they access the data that I'm converting and they create a new copy of the variable. So if I say, take a string and convert it to, to and, I, and do a two upper on it, I get a new string back, okay? It doesn't change the contents of the string I'm converting to uppercase. It creates a new string. That's known as an accessor method, as opposed to a mutator method, which would actually change the contents of the string itself. Okay, so most of the functions that we're dealing with in strings are, are going to be accessor functions, but you want to, but that means you have to, to, to code appropriately, knowing that I can't just say my string dot two upper, and then I get an, a, it's not going to change the value of my string. I have to save that data somewhere. Okay, let's do some examples. While we're talking about this, let's go to REPL. Okay. So let's just say here. I'm just going to say I'm going to declare a string value, and I'm going to call it. Um, I'm just going to call it my name, and it's going to be Bill. Okay. And I'm going to say console. Dot right line. Name. Okay. And then I'm let me get rid of this one. And then I'm going to say my name dot um, to upper. Okay. And then I'm going to say console write line my name. Let's actually just write this out. Okay. So now when I run this, I get these errors because. I used I didn't use the right variable name. 
Okay. But when we, when we run this, notice that we get here. So I, I have three right lines, right? Bill, Bill, and Bill. So the first right line is, is my name. Okay. So I've assigned my name to be Bill with an uppercase B and a lowercase I and a lowercase L and a lowercase L. Okay. So when I right line that out, that's what I get. I'll, you know, I get a mixed case. Here I'm going to say I'm going to right line, and I'm going to right line my name dot two upper. So my name dot two upper takes the value of my name, converts it to all uppercase, and stores it in a new string. Okay, my my name is unchanged. Okay, so when I say console right line my name dot two upper, I get all uppercase bill. But here I come back and I right line my name again, and it's still mixed case. Okay, so this is proving to me that this two upper method is not changing the contents of my string. Okay, it is changing. It's only it's create it's it's creating a new string based on on that value. If I wanted to change my name to be all uppercase, I would have to to do an assignment. Okay, so now when I run this, I only have two right lines, but now the content of my name is changed because when I did the two upper value, he created a new string and I saved that in the my name variable replacing the mixed case value that was there before. Okay? So you have to be careful about are using an access or a mutator. So if you if you want to change something to be two upper and save that so you can use it later, then you need to store it in a variable. Often when you're using two uppers, you're you're just doing it in line. It's just going to be part of an if statement. If you're doing case insensitive um, comparisons. Okay? Let's do an example of that. So I'm going to do a for loop. Okay? And I'm going to say string Exit um, equals, and I'm just gonna just gonna do a blank. I'm gonna say while exit not equal to quit. Okay. I'm gonna say console dot right line. Enter a value or Q to exit. Okay. I'm gonna say um, exit equals console.readline. Okay, so now I'm in a for loop, okay, and I'm just typing values, right, until I type a Q to, to exit, okay. But here, if I type a lowercase Q, it doesn't exit, right, but that should exit, right? I mean, type a Q to exit. It shouldn't matter. If I type an uppercase Q, the program, the program ends. Okay? So here, what I can do is I can say while exit dot to upper not equal to Q. Okay? So now when I run this, I can type any value. If I type an uppercase Q, the program still ends. But if I run it again and I type a lowercase Q, the program also ends. So that gives me case insensitive case insensitive comparisons. Okay? Doesn't change the value of exit, just changes it temporarily so that I can use it in, in, a, in an if statement to do some kind of comparison. Okay? In this class, two upper and two lower, we're going to use them uh, almost entirely for, uh, for input validation from the user. So that when the user types the, the exit word or the sentinel value, that we don't have to um, uh, we don't have to worry about about how they if they use the mixed case term on that. Okay. What if we did this? If we said type quit to continue. Okay. That makes it even a little more obvious. So we can come in here and I can type type in values here and just nothing happens. But I can type quit. Oops. I can type quit in mixed case. Okay. And what did I do wrong? Okay. I must have had some I had some some extra character I typed in that print in the last example. But here because I'm doing the comparison, it doesn't matter if I type quit all lowercase, all uppercase, or mixed case, I'm always gonna hit that condition. Okay. So that's an example of the two upper, um, two lower, and how we how we might use that case insensitive comparison. Okay. 
Are you guys still typing here? Do you need a minute to, to catch up? OK, so um, let's go back and see some more functions, some more examples. Here's some more library functions. These were the string ones we just talked about. Two upper length substring. Let's do the length one real quick. Let's just let's just pop that one on. So we can say here. Um, here we'll write. Um, uh, I'll just write the the length console dot write line. My name dot length. Okay. Well, you notice the difference between here when I do the length built-in function and the two upper built-in function. What's the difference between those two lines? What's missing from the length? It's the parentheses at the end. See here, two upper has parentheses, but when I used length, there's no parentheses. What do you suppose that is? It's a trick question. The, the reason that is is because length is a property of the string as opposed to a function. It works like a function. It kind of looks like a function. It acts like a function. But syntactically, it's a property. Okay. Mm -hmm. The reason it's a property is because it never changes. The answer is always going to be the same. Okay. So whereas two upper, because it's a, it's a, it's a function here, the answer is always going to be the same. But it's a function because it's returning a new string. So it has a return type. Okay. Whereas length. Because I can't change the length of a string, it's it's it is addressed as a property instead of a, of a function. But it looks a lot other than missing pram than missing parentheses there. It behaves very much like a function in your code. Okay. All right. Let's go back here. Okay. Um, here's a. Here's some code here that you can use if you wanted to, to explore. This is the this is the output of this code up here. So we see that if I say the words equals hello world and I say right line the length, I get 11. If I say do a two lower, I get all lowercase. If I get a two upper, I get all uppercase here. If I do a substring, this is say start at position one and go to pos and give me the four uh, four characters afterwards. I get E L L O. What's position one in the string? It's the it's the E. Okay, the the H is at position zero. Okay, whenever we count in C sharp arrays or or strings or lists, they're all going to start at zero. The the first element is the zeroth element. You'll hear me use that word. You may have heard me use that term zeroth a few times. I don't think it's an actually a word. <laughs> I don't think it's actually defined. You won't find it in the dictionary, but it's uh, but it basically is the it's the first element in a zero-based array, the zeroth element. Okay. And then we have this contains. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna want to look at that contains method because that's gonna be in your homework. You're gonna you're gonna need contains. Okay. All right. Any questions on this so far? Making really good sense. Functions. Okay. Here's a uh, an in class experiment we can do. Okay. I'm going to do this one, and then we're going to move on to arrays because um, we're short on time for today. So here's a here's the challenge. Design a function called has vowel that takes one string parameter called vowel. Okay, that determines if a phrase contains a specific vowel. Actually, it takes two it takes two parameters, a string and a vowel. So here's the string that I'm that I want to enter. Here's the string I want to test, and here's the vowel I'm looking for. Okay, so here's some examples. Has vowel, hello as the string type, and an e should return true. Okay. Has vowel, hello, and an uppercase e should also return true. Okay, this is a sentence, and o should return false because there is no o in this is a sentence. Okay, so first things first, we need to define the signature for our function. So what is the signature of our function going to be? Public static. What's the return type of our of our function? 
No. What? It's not a vowel. It's a Boolean. Right. So because here's the examples, test cases. Has vowel, hello, and E returns true. Okay? So our return type is a Boolean. Now what are our parameters? There's two parameters. One's, a, one's the string we want to test, and one's the vowel we want to test for. What are the data type of the parameters? Strings. They're strings. They're not characters. Character is, is actually a different data type in C Sharp than string. Okay? So, but they're, they're going to be strings. Okay? So I think somebody answered before when we were talking about return type. I think you got mixed up in the, we're in the, in the, in the parameters or the arguments, right? You've got to keep those two separate. The arguments or the parameters are what are the input where we're sending into the function. The return type is what we're sending out. Okay, so two different, um, two different steps. Okay, all right. So let's let's try to implement this. I'm going to go ahead and start a new REPL. We're going to call it C sharp, and we're going to call it. Week five in class um, function example. Okay, so in my in my um, assignment here, I have some test cases. Okay, has vowel hello e should return true. Okay, so let's just build. A little test case structure around that. We call this the assertion pattern. Okay, I can say console dot right line, and I can say has vowel hello e. Okay, so what I expect here is that it should print out true, right? Because has vowel is going to return a boolean. It takes two. It takes two parameters, both strings, the string I'm searching and the vowel I'm searching for. Okay. And so it should return true or false. So if I run this, if it works correctly, it should print out true. Okay. So if we run it, I get an error because I didn't define has vowel. So has vowel does not exist in the current context is the error. Because I'm, call, I'm calling a function, but I haven't defined it. Okay, so I'm going to define it. So I need to pick the right place in my code to define it. So it's still inside the main class, but after <clears throat> after the main module. Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to define it just like I defined, just like the the main method is defined. Public static, what did we say the return type is? Boolean. Bool. What's the name? Has vowel. And what are the what are the, the arguments? There's two. String, which is so and I need to name it something other than string, so let's call it phrase. Okay. And then string vowel. Okay. And I put my open and close block in place. Okay? Now, how do I how do I get this to work? I I can use the contains built-in method, right? <clears throat> so this is really simple. I'm just going to do return phrase dot contains vowel. Run it. What happens? I get a true. Good for me. Okay, everybody with me? This makes perfect sense, right? Maybe? Makes a little sense? Makes no sense at all. Partial sense. It gets easier. The more you do it, the easier it gets. I know I keep saying that. <laughs> when does that start? Hopefully this week. Okay, 
let's do the next test case. So the next test case was here. Hello, with a capital E should also return true. Okay, so let's go ahead and put that test case in here. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this one because I'm lazy. Capital E. Now if I run that, <clears throat> I got a false. Why did I get a false? <laughs> I got a false because there is no capital E in hello, but I want I want that to be true. My my assignment says that returns true. If I look here at the challenge, it says that this should be true. So it must be a case insensitive match. Okay. So what do I need to do to make that a case insensitive? I need some two uppers or two lowers. One of the two. I just have to be the same, be consistent. Anybody want to take a guess? Let's just convert them both to two upper. Phrase dot two upper contains vowel dot two upper. Because I want to do a case insensitive comparison. So I'm going to take the phrase and the vowel and I'm going to convert them both to uppercase and then compare them. So now it doesn't matter if I'm, see, in my two examples, I'm looking for a lowercase e and an uppercase e. And it, in my test case says it doesn't matter, that it should be case insensitive comparison. So I'm going to just compare them both to two upper. I could just as easily compare them both to two lower. It doesn't matter as long as phrase and vowel are the same case. Either, either all uppercase or all lowercase. It doesn't matter which one as long as they're both the same. Okay. So by forcing them to both to be two upper, then my comparison should work. Okay. And then here, if I do console.writeline, and they'll say this is a sentence, and I want to know if it has a lowercase o, if it has an o in it, and I click run, that should also be false. Whoops, I missed, missed that up. I forgot to call my method. Okay, so that's going to be false, which is what I wanted, which is what I wanted it to be. Okay, so if we look at our challenge. It says if I run these three commands, I should get true, true, and false. Okay. Okay. Who's got it? We're still typing a little bit? Okay. <clears throat> Makes sense? Do you have a question? So because I'm doing a whole bunch of steps here, so I'm 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 putting all these 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 I'm putting these two methods together. Okay. So I'm gonna start here by taking phrase that two upper. So that takes phrase, converts it to all to uppercase, and, and that's creates a new string. And I'm gonna test that new string to see if it contains the vowel. Okay. So I could have done this in in two steps. Upper phrase equals phrase dot two upper. Okay. String upper vowel equals vowel dot two upper. Okay, and they could have done return upper phrase dot contains upper vowel. Okay, so that's okay. But but what is so so these these three statements and this one statement are the same, they're identical, okay? What I've done here is, is here upper phrase, what is the value of upper phrase? I've assigned it to this phrase.upper, okay? So if I just come in here and I say, I don't have to use upper phrase, I could just use phrase.upper, dot two upper. 
sorry, typing. Okay, you see how that works? So simply, I simply take upper upper phrase here, which I've defined as a new variable to be phrased at two upper, and I just replace that with that expression. So I can I can do these all these expressions in line. I don't have to do them one at a time. I can do them all in line. Okay. Okay. Let's do another one. Let's do this one. Let's roll a die. Okay? Like we're playing a game. So if I roll six, I'm going to return a number between one and six. Okay? If I roll 12, it's like a 12-sided die. I'm going to return a number between one and 12. Okay? So let's let's so we're going to need to do a random number generator here. And fortunately, there's a there's a, a link here to the random number generator documentation on Microsoft.com. Okay, you're going to need to pay attention to this because there's a random number generator in your homework assignment. Okay, so let's do this one as an example. New REPL. Week five, let's call this week six random number. I'm changing to week six instead of week five in my example because we're kind of starting to step into the array examples. Not quite, but we're starting to touch on this week's material. Okay. So, so let's let's do something here. We're gonna we're gonna create a stub. Okay. A stub is just a, a quick way, a creative method or creative function that just returns a simple value so that I can run my program. My, my function isn't done, but my program is syntactically correct and it runs. Okay? So that's just so now I can work on, on, the, on the code itself. Okay? So I do a stub by saying, um, let's just say um, integer value equals roll between six. And I'm going to say console.writeline. Um, you rolled a um, value. You rolled a whatever that's going to come back as. Okay, and then I can just copy that again and say values between one and twelve, and I'll just run that again. Okay. So when I run this, I get an error because I because roll is not is not defined. Okay. So I can then define my method public static um, it's going to be an integer it's called roll it takes an integer value of the max value the maximum value okay and it's and I'm just going to return here I'm just going to return a zero okay this is known as stubbing okay so what I've done here is I've gotten my method defined and I didn't actually implement the method role. I just did the minimum I could to get it to compile and run, which is just return an integer. So in this case, I'm returning a zero, which is which will never be an answer because a die can never be zero. A die is always going to be one through six, one through twelve, according to the specification of my um, of my problem. Okay. So, but I've stubbed that role function. This this implementation right here, lines eleven through thirteen, is known as a stub. Okay, so now I can I can go work on some other part of the program if I wanted, or I could start working on this function because I've got this done enough so that it compiles and runs. It's not finished, but it's not blocking me from making progress elsewhere in the program. Okay, all right. So now, how do I do a random number? 
How would you find out how to do random number? Yeah, I could Google random number in C sharp, right? I could I could go to this documentation here. Okay. And it says you can use the random dot next method. Okay. I can scroll down here, I can get an example. Here's an example. Random equals rand dot new random. Okay. The random number generator is a special kind of, of class in that we actually have to create an instance of it. Unlike the console and convert, those are classes that we're using, but we're not we're they're just built in, they're static classes. The random number generator is not a static class. Okay. So in order to generate a random number, I actually have to create an instance of the random class. In your assignment for week six, you have to do a whole bunch of random number generation. Okay? And so pay attention to this. So if we, if we were to dive into this, we can see that we say, I'm going to declare a variable named random. It has a data type of random with a capital R. The variable is actually named RND, not random, it's abbreviated RND. And we assign it this new random. So basically this is saying create a random number generator. This is a built-in thing that C Sharp is doing for us. Okay? And then I can just say, um, give me the next random number. Okay? And here I can use, I have this over this overload here, which takes two values, a min value and a max value. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I want a random number between 1 and 6, I can use this, this method, the next method with a minimum value. Now let's read, the, let's read the description. The minimum says this is an inclusive lower bound of the, random number, of the random number returned. The max value here says this is an exclusive upper bound of the random, random, random number returned. What do you think that means, inclusive and exclusive? Whether inclusive is whether or not the value is included in the return set. Okay, so inclusive, so the, the inclusive lower bound means that whatever I put in min value, I'm going to get that, I possibly will get that back as an answer. So if I say min value of 1, then possibly my answer could be 1. Okay, exclusive upper bound, if I put in a 6, that's exclusive, which means that 6 will never be the answer. Okay, it's because it's exclusive. So, so I, if I'm gonna, so if I want a number between one and six, what what values do I have to send here as arguments to this to this method? I need to send a one and a seven, a six plus one, right? Okay, because it's exclusive. Okay, now why is it exclusive? That goes back to the way random number generators work. Is they actually generate decimal numbers? And then do multiplication on them, okay? And so that's just a um, the vagary of random number generation, okay? So here, if I want a random number generator, I can go back to my um, to my documentation here. Here's an example, okay? So I'm just going to copy this. I'm just going to straight cut and paste it, okay? Declare that value. And then to get the to get the the random number generator, here's one. Here's an example. Or here's a better one. Between one and eleven. Okay, so I'm just going to copy that. I'm just going to say return random number next between one and max plus one. Okay, so now when I run that, I get a six and a seven. If I run it again, I'm going to get something else. A two and a six, two sixes, a two and a nine, a three and a one. It's going to be different every time, but it's always going to be between one and six on the first number, and one and twelve. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of function work here. Okay, 
Here's a, here's a function I defined called role. It takes, it, I'm sending one argument of 12. It's implemented here as an integer return type. I'm saving the value of role in, in, this, in, this, met, in this variable called value, which has an integer data type. And then in this case, I'm just printing it out. Right, it's making sense. Israe, staring quizzically at the screen. All right, I'll give you guys a second to catch up. Okay, so the first time that first six to three space was rolling out of a value of six, the other one was value let's say like twelve sides. That yes, that's what you're seeing there. I've called it roll. It's really just a random number generator, right? right? Well, I've called it roll because it's simulating a dice game. That was my assignment anyway, to simulate a dice game. What's R&D? Right here. R&D is a variable, and that is the random number generator. So in order to do a random number, gen a random number in C Sharp, I have to create an instance of a random number generator, which is which is this new random. Okay, and and we'll talk about this a little bit, but for now you're just going to have to accept that if you want a random number generator, you have to do that. Okay, but but essentially what we're doing is a, is the random number generator is a class, just like the convert class or the console class, but because I can have more than one, I create an instance. There's only one console, right? There's only one console. It's the one that I'm using when I when I'm inputting and outputting data with the user. Okay, but a random number generator I can have more than one. Okay, so in this case I'm creating an instance of it by using new random, and then it has a built-in method here called next. Okay, does everybody have this working? Mike, are you with us? Yes. Yes, Ray? Okay, so real quick, while we're here, I'm going to do another value here and say, let's just do a value, a roll between 1 and let's just do 9. Okay, we've been doing this interpolation formatting here, and I have to admit shamefully that this is actually not called interpolation, this is called composite formatting. So there's also the shorthand for interpolation, which you can do this. How about that? Okay. See the difference in what I've done there? Let's do another example. So let's say int one equals roll six and two equals roll six and three equals roll six. Okay. I can do this shorthand interpolation by using the special dollar sign symbol and then a string value and I can say one equals one, two equals two. So in this case, instead of putting the zero, one, two, three values inside my, my curly braces to get the formatting, I can just put the variable name. I just wanted to show this to you because it might make some of your some of your stuff simpler to read. Okay, so the only difference between between this composite formatting, this composite interpolation, and this string interpolation is that here I'm using zero, one, two, three as my placeholders, and then I'm I'm putting the values here in commas 
in a common delimited list at the end of the of the of the right line. Here I precede the string with the specials character of dollar sign, and then I can just put the, the variables right inside. Okay. So which one is easier to read? I mean they they both get the job done. But with the composite formatting would be So which one's easier to read? I kind of like that second one, you know, on line 15. That's pretty nice. They either works. I know I just taught you something, and I'm teaching you something else. It's like it's like knowledge never stops. Run it. Yeah. Is yours not working? <coughs> so here, because you're using the, 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 this, this dollar sign there, you don't need to leave that there. Okay, you don't need to fix this up. Okay. See, I have two lines. Okay, so see where I have the dollar sign, I just use the variable names inside the thing. So this would be the variable name three. Instead of the, the number three, it would be the variable name three. Okay. Then you see how on like so that's like on like 15 or like 14. That's how we use it with the with zero and three and zero ones. So that should work. No, it would be zero if you're using the, the, the other method, the composite format, because it's it's now zero one two, and you're saying it would be zero in the first and second. Yes, sir. The error says line five. Oh, you just use the lowercase on line five. Spelling mistake. Okay. Spelling blocks semicolons. Okay, everybody with me on this? Okay. Any questions for your homework assignment that's due tonight at midnight? This example we just did of the role is really close. Okay, given a, I collect an, so in this case, I collect a number from the user. Okay, I send, I collect a number from the user, I send that number to a method, and I get back a string A, B, C, D, or F, and I print that out in a line. Okay, so what we just did here, in these three lines, I collect, I, I get a number from a method. In this case, it's an integer. I don't collect it from the user. I just, I just get it back from the, from the method. But here, so once, so if I did, if I did this, console dot right line, enter max, roll value. 
Okay. And then I do int max equals roll, or I'm sorry, int max equals convert dot to int32 console dot readline. And I made this should be a period, not a comma right there. Okay, and then here I say enter to the max, right? So then I I collect a, I collect a value from the user. I send my val I send that value to a method, and I save the return value from the method, and then I write it out in a I write it out in a in a write line. Okay, click run. Okay, the max roll value is a six. Okay, so I hope you're seeing the corollary here. Now, in your example, in your homework, basically these three lines, except I'm only going to do it once. Instead of do, here, I'm doing it three times one, two, three. But these lines, you're going to prompt for a value, you're going to do a, a convert and a read line, you're going to send the value to a method, you're going to write out the answer that the method returns. Okay, so now in here, instead of doing a random number generator, you're going to do an if a range a range check with an if statement. Okay, if the grade is greater than ninety, then you get an A. If the grade is greater than eighty, then you get a B. Okay, so it's a range check if if else statement. Okay, so at this point, you guys should have this. Okay. And my guess also is that if you spent any amount of time on Google, you would find the solution. However, I know what the solutions on Google look like. So <coughs> use them as a guide. Do not copy them. OK? OK, so your homework. Here's a, here's a console.write line, inner grade number one. I've got a little counter going on there, right? Oh, I'm keeping track of the average, which we did in last week's assignment. We've already done keeping track of the average, right? Here's a console or, console or write line. Here's a console or read line. In between those, I'm calling a method, saving the, val the return value of the method, and then here I'm writing it out. I've got a while loop around that. No, it's a for loop because I'm, I'm just getting five, right? Yeah. So it's a for loop, so I'm just getting five grades, and then I have the answer. Okay? So you guys should have this. Okay? And I would I would hope that you wouldn't spend more than an hour on this. <laughs> After today's examples, I would hope it wouldn't take you more than about an hour. I put the uh, running code wondering to mine as well. Okay. Sure. Just showing off? Is that? <laughs> well, I just thought like I had it there and I was yeah. like, test and like do we get it? Sure. Yeah, some you know, sometimes you know, when you're writing when you're as you're as you're working up something, you might have what we call debug statements, you know, where you just start writing things out to the console just so you can right. keep track of what's going on in your code. And then once your code is done, you might go back and take them out, right? So um, they're just there to help you as your as your code is 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 developing. Okay, any questions about tonight's homework assignment? <coughs> Let's see. So you need pseudocode and a C sh and a C sharp implementation in Repl. Okay. Okay. Why is that? The pseudocode is going to come out a little bit longer than, than the C sharp, okay? Because you're doing your declares in the pseudocode, and in C sharp we do those in line. And we're all doing like display eventual text for one, two, three, four, like individually. Well, in your pseudocode, that should still be in a, that should still be in a for loop because we have pseudocode construct to do a for loop, okay? So.
So if here, if I wanted to do pseudocode, I'm just going to do an example here at the bottom. If I want to do pseudocode for for loop here, right, I just do begin main, right, and then I say for counter equals 1 to 5. I need to do a declare there. Declare integer counter. Okay. And then here I'm going to say display enter something. Right. And then I'm going to do um, number equals. Uh, oops, I'm going to be input number, and then you'd come up here and you need to do a declare. Okay, and I'm going to say um, letter equals um, grade range number, right? And I'm going to do display. Your grade, dot, dot, you know, whatever that is. Okay? <coughs> then I get an N4. Okay? Now, I, of course, in here I also have to do, I'm keeping track of my sum. So, but, but this is going to be a little longer. Oh, and I have to declare the letter too. letter and that's going to be a string. Okay, So this is a little longer than it would be in C-sharp because I have those three declarations that are on a separate line in my pseudocode that I'm doing inline in my C-sharp. I've got this end for statement in, in my, which is really just a closed curly brace. Right, my for, my for loop here is one line, you know, but you know, so here, so the contents of my for loop is only going to be four lines. In C sharp, each one of these lines translates directly into one line of C sharp. Okay, so here, to write C sharp for this for this exact loop, these three declares are gone, but each of these goes. So I've got what is that? That's three, four, six. So that's nine lines of pseudocode, but it'll be six lines. It'll be five lines of code and then a closed brace, a closed curly brace, so six lines. So your pseudocode is going to be, a, is going to, sometimes comes out a little longer. Okay, but it'll be close, I mean. Okay. Any other questions about tonight's assignment? It's due at 11.59. Clock is ticking. Okay, if you have any questions, um, I can't say after class today, but um, you can email me, and I'll answer them as soon as I can. Okay. Let's proceed. You have an assignment. You have two assignments due on Sunday. You can read these. We'll go over them at the beginning of class on Thursday, but I encourage you to read them and take a look at them. So you had a little bit of time, a little bit of extra time on last week's assignments because we missed a class period, but we, um, uh, you're back on your Sunday schedule today. Okay. All right. So we still have we still have several minutes of class left. We still have half an hour. Let's start talking about arrays. Okay, so your homework this weekend is to use arrays. Okay, you, you'll use an array to to calculate um, a thousand random numbers, store them in array. Um, is it a thousand or a hundred? Yes, a thousand random numbers, store them in an array, and then do some summations and 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 evaluation on them. Okay, so you're going to use a you're going to use an array to store to, to, to store a thousand numbers, and then you're going to um, do analysis over those thousand numbers using a um, 
um, using some for loops. Okay. Uh, this is probably chapter seven, I think. Okay. We're going out of we're going out of order here. We're skipping. We're doing chapter seven, and I think we haven't done chapter six checks yet. We'll do that next week. This is chapter eight. Is it chapter eight? A race. Is it really? Yeah. Is this the fourth edition? Well, that's true. I've got the fourth. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, that's that's for doing? Can I explain that? Does it matter that we're doing it out of order? Like, no. how does this work? It doesn't matter. I say it doesn't matter. So. Yeah. I've read version of it Yeah, chapter eight. Last semester I did these and we did them in reverse order. That's probably why it's number seven on mine. Okay, so it's chapter eight, talks about arrays. Okay, so um, the very simple, very simply, an array is an ordered list of values, okay? Also known as elements. It's really just a way for you to store a lots of different values in a single variable name. Okay, so if I have an array, I have I have an array of integers. I just have more than one integer, and they all have the same variable name of of whatever I've defined, array name. Okay, then I can pick each element out of the array using the index value. So this is so this is a visual of an array. So this whole thing is an array. Okay, it has ten elements. Each, each column here is an element, okay? The single name, we haven't named this array, but let's say that the array is called scores, okay? So then the index here, this is index zero, and it has a value of 100. This is index one, it has a value of 79. Again, we're going at zero-based um, zero counting, okay? The array has a size, okay, so in this case the size of the array is 10, okay, because it has 10 elements. That's what we call length, okay, but it's, but it has, um, it has a size, it has a length of 10, okay, but it has elements 0 through 9, okay, so because we start, because our we're going to start counting at zero on the on the indices. Okay, so in this case, the, we've defined the array. It's called scores, and then we address the the individual elements using the square bracket notation. Okay, so in this case, scores of zero has a value of one hundred. Scores of four has a value of ninety six. What is scores of eight of seven? Ninety nine, right? Because it's the seventh, and we would say scores. And a seven inside the square brackets, and it would be evaluate to ninety nine. Okay. So you can you can read and write to these variables just like you would any other variable. So if I once I define an array of, of scores with ten elements, now score zero, scores one, scores two, those are all variable names, and I can I can assign a value to them by using the same notation I would any, I would any other variable. Scores at zero equals one hundred. Scores at four equals ninety six. I can use them in an if statement. If scores at, at, at index 2 equals 100, then do something. Okay? I can use them in a console or write line. Your, sword, your score is scores at element 4. Okay? So once I've defined that variable scores as an integer data type, now each element is a, is a standalone unique integer. Okay? Now what's the data type of the array? What's the data type of scores? It is not an integer, but I can see why you would want it to be, but it's not. What do you think the data type of scores is? It is an array of integers, okay? So the, the, the data type of scores is an array of integers. What's the data type of scores zero? That, that's an integer, right? Okay, so the, the scores is an array Scores at zero is an integer. Okay, does that make sense? 
because scores the scores array is different from an integer. Okay, it's not an integer; it's an array of integers, and you have to treat it like an array. Scores at zero is not an array; it's a single element, which is a which is a single integer. Okay, so make that dis that distinction that the data type of the array is not the same as the data type of the individual elements. Okay, got it. Okay. Now, the elements in the array must all be the same data type. So once you build an array, you can build it to be an array of integers, an array of double, an array of whatever, an array of random number generators, if you really wanted it to be. But all of the elements in the array have to be the same data type. Okay? In C sharp, you cannot have an array that has that has an integer and then a double and a string in 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 the in the array. Okay? That is not true in every language. That is true in C sharp. Okay, so the, every element in the array has to be um, has to be the same um, has to be the same data type. You create an array by using the new keyword, just like when we were doing the random number generator example. We're creating an instance of a random number generator here. Here, you're creating an instance of an array. Okay, so you have to you have to create it using the new data type in C sharp or the new uh, command in C sharp. So this says I'm defining a variable variable named scores. What's the data type of scores going to be? An integer array. So I'm so that's so what we're looking at here, int with the square brackets, that is a data type definition of integer array. Okay, it means it's an integer, and I put the square brackets right after it to, to mean that it's going to be an array. So this is a data type. Okay? This is the variable name. And now I'm creating an array. So this so I'm, now I'm going to say it's a new integer array of length 10. Okay, So this is an, array, an integer array data type. This is the name of the variable. This new integer 10 creates an array of integers of length 10. Okay, I can also create an array this way using the list um, initialization. Here's int as a int array as, a, as the data type. Scores is the name. And then I can say I want a new integer, but instead of saying how many elements is in it, I give you, I'm going to give you the initialization list. The list is in curly braces, comma separated. So now what's the length of scores in this second definition down here? What's going to be the length of that array? Six, six right? Because there are six elements in the list. Okay. So I don't have to specify six here because, because I'm using the list initialization. I get an array of six automatically. And each element, the first element is going to, well, the zeroth element is going to be 100. The first element is going to be 96. The second element is going to be 97, etc. Up here, when I create this, all of the elements are going to be zero because I didn't initialize them to anything. Okay? Once I make an array, I can't make it any bigger. So if I make an array of 10, it's 10. I can create a new array and copy the values of the old array if I need to make it bigger. But I cannot change the length of an array once I've, once I've created it. Okay. If I attempt to access an array that's, that's either less than the element of an array less than 0 or greater than the length minus 1, then I'm going to get an error. Okay, And I'm going to get this error called index out of range exception. And it's going to be very ugly in REPLit and cause you much stress and consternation. Okay, So just be aware that this index out of range error means that you tried to access the, an element of an array that didn't exist. Okay, The compiler can't tell you that it's out of range because it doesn't know if it's out of range until you actually run the code. Okay, So that's a runtime error that the compiler is not going to catch for you. Okay, So this will happen while you're running. Usually you get that if you're running a for loop or you're doing some analysis on an array and, you, and you're not using your boundaries correctly. Most commonly in this class, what will happen is you will attempt, you'll say this array has 10 elements and you'll attempt to access element number 10. That will be an index out of range exception. If an array has 10 elements, what's the, what's the highest element number? What's that? Nine. Nine. Right, so if I declare an array of 10, and I access array element number 10, that's an index out of range exception. That doesn't exist. Those elements are 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, 9. Okay? 
And then again, the length is a property, not a, not a method or a, or a function on the array, and so it it's a so it doesn't have the parentheses. Okay. We can use a for loop to iterate over an array. So this is what we call it. When we say I want to iterate over an array, that means I want to write a for loop. And for each iteration, I want to do something for each element in the array. The shorthand terminology for that is iterate over the array. OK? I want to iterate the array. I want to iterate over the array. OK? I want to write a for loop where the block inside the for loop does something to each element in the array. Okay, so here's an example of taking an array and just printing it out. So I'm declaring an array of scores. It's an integer array. I'm using the list list initialization to, to create it. So I get an array of six with these values. I then print out the length of the array on the console and then I write a for loop. Okay, so here I'm just iterating over the array and printing it out. Okay, now notice in my loop, what my, what my condition is. I'm going to start at zero, but I'm going to go to less than scores.length. Okay? It is not less than or equal to scores.length. It is less than scores.length. Right? Because if I say, if I, in my array here example, how many elements are in the array? What's the length of the array? This example on screen, what's the length of the array? Six. Six. Right? So what are the indices of the array? 0 through 5, that's right. So here when I'm doing my for loop, I want to do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so I want to stop at less than 6. Okay. If I did less than or equal to scores.length, what would happen? I'd get up to 6 and I would get index out of range exception. Okay, Because there is no scores at 6. Okay. So whenever you're iterating over an array, Always make sure that you do less than. Okay, this is going to be a common mistake. Okay, because your fingers are going to want to type less than or equal to here for some reason. Okay, don't do it. Okay, that is, that will be a common mistake as you, as you start getting into this. Okay, there's also a special kind of for loop for arrays called a for each. This is just shorthand for a for loop. So here, when I say for each, for, so for each integer score in scores. And so what this does is it, is it just runs a, runs a for loop. There's no counter in this case. Okay, It runs the for loop and it just uses, it, the value of score will be scores at 0, scores at 1, scores at 2, scores at 3 for each, for each iteration of the loop. Okay, When do you use a for loop versus a for each loop? There is a reason. Anybody want to take a guess? What would you think? The short answer is like we have a, a, a while loop versus a for loop. Use a for loop when you know how many times you're going to want to do something, right? I want to do something five times, I'm going to use a for loop. I'm going to use a while loop if it's condition controlled, and I'm just going to do it until something happens. I don't know how many times I want to do it. I'll use the count controlled loop. The difference between a for each and a for when you're iterating an array is whether or not you care to know which element you're iterating. Okay, so here in a for loop, I have this variable i, which is the counter. So I know that I'm processing the zeroth, the first, the second, the third element in the array. Okay, here I just get the score. I don't know which element it is. Okay, so I could look it up. I could back into that, but it's really just more straightforward to do the for loop here. And if you read online about fours and for each, um, it's a little bit like like going to church. You know which one you should use and which one you shouldn't. They are one of them. You know, in certain situations, one or the other might be faster, but it's going to be so minimally so in in the arrays that we deal with, unless you're dealing with arrays of or lists of hundreds of millions of entries. Is not going to matter. Okay. In our class, we're mostly going to use the for loop. We'll use the for each occasionally, but mostly it's going to be the for loop. And either one works. You can use either. There, the the for loop can can be used in every situation where the for each can be used. 
Okay. All right, so the arrays have some built-in methods, some built-in functions. Just like the string methods, arrays have arrays have, have the length property. They also have sort. Okay? If I take array.sort, it's going to sort the array. So if I take and it's going to sort based on the, the default comparison of, of the data type. So if it's a number, it's going to sort from zero to it's going to sort in ascending order, from the lowest number to the highest number. Okay. So the sort is a mutator function. Remember we talked about accessors versus mutators. An accessor was the was string dot two upper was an accessor. What is the difference between an accessor and a mutator? Anybody remember? If you're watching the video, you can just rewind about forty five minutes, and you can find the answer. An accessor takes the value of the variable, does does something to it, converts it to uppercase to lowercase, and returns a new copy. Okay, does not change the original variable. A mutator changes the original value of the variable. So array.sort, when I run that, the variable is now changed. What was in sort zero is not necessarily, it's still in sort zero after this, after I run, I'm sorry, what's an array at zero, after I run the sort, that value is may not may no longer be an element zero. Okay, when I sort it, I'm going to change. I still have ten elements in the array, but I've changed the order of them, and I can't and I will not be able to get back to what it was before I ran the sort. Okay, we'll do. What's what's not what's not the index does not change. What changes is the contents of at each index, right? Okay. So using the, you can write a sort manually. There's several different sorts: quick sort, bubble sort, boolean, you know, um, uh, different types of sorts. So if uh, one part of your program you have that you want to use this index value, then you write a sort. You can't go back to that because it's a different. Program. Once yes, once you use the sort, you cannot be guaranteed that the index that you knew before the sort. Right. It's the same value, right? Okay, because you've changed the contents of the array. It still has ten elements in it. The ten elements are all the same, but they're not in the same place anymore. Okay, so the array, the built-in sort function will does a quick analysis of the array and uses the fastest sort method. So you could write your own sort. If you were to go Google, you know, array sorting mechanisms or array sorting algorithms, you would find a bunch of different a bunch of different ways that you can do it. Array dot sort. Um, does some analysis on the array and picks the fastest one. It's just based on some quick stats about the array, how long it is, what kind of data type it is, things like that. Okay. So um, array.sort. You can also join an array. Here's this is a string.join. This is a built-in method on string, but you can use that to to, vis to to visualize an array. Okay. So here if I take string.join, okay, and I Join it with a with a comma, and then I give it an array. So the string dot join is a method. It returns what kind of data type do you think it returns? A string, right? And then it takes two parameters. It takes a join character, and it takes an array. And what it does is it just produces a string that has the zeroth element, comma, first element, comma, second element, comma, etc., all the way to the end. Okay. So we'll use this um, in class when we just want to print out an array so we can see what's in it. Okay, it's usually for a debug step, something that just helps us to understand what our data looks like as the program is running. <coughs> okay, there's this other kind of uh, arrays are a kind of co of collection. Okay, in that we you can have something called a list and a dictionary. Okay. We're going to be making extensive use of lists, so we're going to do some examples with arrays, um, but we're also going to use lists. And the, the really the key difference between a list and an array is one is how you define them. Okay, you define a list this way as opposed to the array, which we use the square bracket notation to define. Okay, um, the the key value the the the, the reason we would use a list instead of an array is that you can make a list bigger. 
Okay, if I don't know how many elements I'm going to have, I'll use a list because I can just add things to the end of the list. Whereas in an array, once I've defined the array, I can't make it any bigger. Whereas once I've defined a list, I can add things to it and shrink and increase it and shrink it much more easily. Okay, so we'll be using we'll be using lists. You also have the special kind of collection called the dictionary, which is a key value pair. I'm not going to cover. I'm not going to dive into that much here. If you want to read about that. Um, you can think of that as a, as a fast way to look something up. So a key value pair, think of it as like the um, looking up something in a dictionary. The, the key being the word that's being defined and the value being the definition. Okay, So I can get to those very quickly using this dictionary structure. Okay, All right, so hold that in your mind. We're going to use lists. We'll get into that probably after spring break. We'll start using lists pretty extensively. Okay. All right, we're going to use this data structure concept called a, called parallel arrays. And we're going to be using this a lot from here on through toward, towards the end of the class. Parallel array is multiple arrays that are holding different pieces of data where each indice in each array is related to the other. Okay, so in this case, project one, project two, project three, test one. Those are the assignment names. And then the grades, 195, 80, 87. If I say these are parallel arrays, then you know that assignments at 2 and grades at 2 are related data. So assignments at 2 is, is, has the value of project 3, and grades at 2 has the, has the value of 90. So we can infer that the grade for project 3 was a 90. Okay. So we use these parallel arrays or parallel lists to say that the, val the, the indice in each array is related to the, the matching indice in the other arrays. Okay, So we will create these in order to store more complex um, data sets to run our, our algorithms on. Think of the grade roster for a class. Okay, Think of the sales, the sales data for a car dealership. Okay, That's more than one piece of data. I need to know the name of the salesman, the date of the sale, how much the sale was for, what kind of car was bought. So I, have, may, I may have five or six pieces of information about that sale. In our class, we're going to use a data structure of parallel arrays to store that information so that we can create more complex, um, more, so that we can use more complex data sets to create more interesting solutions. Yes, sir? The parallel, yeah, if you say the arrays are parallel, the links have to be the same. Okay, otherwise, they don't work, right? And so, and if you make a change to element two in an array, you have to consider: Do I need to? Does this does this maintain my parallelness? Which also I don't think is a word. Maybe does somebody look it up? See if parallelness is a word. So, but that so if I'm changing those, I have to make sure that I um, that I'm keeping them parallel. Okay. Here's an example. Here's sales data. So here's the the name of. Here's the name of the sales. Here's how many sales they made. Here's the total sales dollars. Okay, so here we can say Roberto had 32 sales for $8,765. Bob had 10 sales for $4,356. Parallel rates. Parallelism. Parallelism. Parallelism is a word. Parallelness, I don't think is a word, but it should be because I used it in a very in a very appropriate manner. Okay, so we also have multi-dimensional arrays. So here I can declare an array, and I'm going to bring this up. We are not going to do any examples on this, okay? But I want to just bring this up. You can declare a multi-dimensional array by saying by using this comma notation inside the square brackets. So think of this as being like a, a matrix or a table, okay? This is a two-dimensional array. What we're working with is just a one-dimensional array because it just has one one row and one set of columns. In this case, I can declare a three by three array. Which means I now have 0, 0, 1, 1, here's 0, here's 0, 2. So my, my rows and columns, I now have rows and columns. Okay? And I could add a third dimension, so now I would have rows, columns, and levels. Think of like three dimensional chess. If you remember what a three dimensional chess board would look like, you could define that with a three, with a three dimensional array. Okay? So just so we know about those, we will not be using those. Um, in our work. We will, we will pick up here on Thursday where we'll start doing exercises with arrays. Okay? If you wanted to dive into these and work on these, you can. Um, 
you can try to solve these challenges these uh, uh, or do some reading just Google for C sharp array tutorials and you'll find some interesting work okay we'll pick up here and we'll do some in-class examples um, on Thursday and then you'll be by then you should have everything you need for your homework I would take a look at the homework assignments and at least st start working out some pseudocode if you can okay all right. Thank you. We'll see you Thursday.